When I wake up in the morning, I understand that it's different. I have to tell you though, I don't wake up and say, I'm blind, I'm feeling depressed. That doesn't happen to me. I also don't wake up in the morning and say, or wish I could see. That doesn't happen either. The things I want to do are in my mind from even last night. I want to wake up in the morning. I know I'm going to stretch. I'm going to do 20, 30 minutes of Tai Chi. I'm going to make some emails, some phone calls. And then I'm either, if I'm in my groove to write, I write. Or if I got a painting in my head, I set that up. I grew up in New York City until about the age of six, and then my mom decided to, it was time to get out of New York City, and my grandparents had moved to a really quaint, beautiful little village in Long Island called Stony Brook. It was on the northern shore of Long Island. And um, so that's where I went to public school, first grade, in Stony Brook. I played sports from there on in. I, I was running track and field, playing basketball in first grade through, uh, you know, junior high school. I was preparing for a nursery school, and I told them there'd be a snack time, a nap time, and a play time. I prepared them completely. I thought. A week later, he said, "Mom, you didn't tell me something about nursery school." And I said, "What?" <laughs> we used to get the fire hydrants and flood the basketball courts and so they would cover it with ice. Instead of playing hockey, we'd play basketball on it. <laughs> and we'd wear these big jackets and stuff so if we fell, we'd slide on this, you know, this extra cushion and padding. Um, it was really, really a cool place to grow up. I didn't tell them the same children were going to be there every day. <laughs> and think about it, we would go to the park Riverside Park in Manhattan and he would always have different children to play with. He never knew who was going to be there. So he felt that security and I thought that was amazing that he was so observant a week and he said the same kids are there every day. <laughs> I had a great childhood that was very athletic. I just grew up outside and played outside all day and ran all day and just really grew up uh, very healthy kid. When I went to nursery school and the teacher exclaimed how wonderful it was to have George in the class and what a wonderful job you and your husband have done and I just gloated and thought to myself, yes, I can do it, I can do it. And we did it together. And we started playing baseball again like we always did. And I, ha I started having trouble seeing the baseball in the grass. So the funny story was, once the ball, I could still see it, but once the ball would get real green, we had to buy another one, brand new white one. So that summer we had like rooms full of white baseballs. His father left us when he was just a baby. So consequently, I've been his mother and his dad all these years and on Father's Day and Mother's Day, he gives me a card, <laughs> which I appreciate. I think that's cute. I think it was a full summer, and the end of that summer, like I said, I don't know if I was 12 or 13. I might have even been 14. I don't remember. But um, Bobby threw me, a, you know, we always just play uh, catcher and pitcher. And he threw me uh, a real hard fastball, and I didn't see it. Another time we went to church and he said, I can't read the psalm numbers. And the ball went straight into the mitt. And that was the last time he played baseball. And I didn't know what was going on. What psalm numbers are there so we can sing? So there was these little hints, but 
it snuck up on them so fast that we weren't aware of it. I was uh, about nine years old when I had a very, very strange dream. Um, in my dream, I saw myself running through the woods. It was dark out, and it was like clouds of mist rolling in from the ocean. And it was like this puffs of white mist along with the darkness. And I had to duck real low because the branches and the woods were, that were overhanging from the trees were cutting my eyes and face. And all of a sudden, like this huge dark cloud rolled in from the dream and, and went into my face and into my eyes. And it's like I woke up and I was screaming, I'm going blind, I'm going blind, I'm going blind. Well, the teacher told me that he needed eyeglasses, so it's okay. So we went to the eye doctor, and George was in there a long time. And the eye doctor came out and he says, I don't think I can help your son. You're gonna to have to go somewhere else. I was shocked. And he recommended the ear, nose, throat hospital in Manhattan. And we made an appointment to go there. And that's when George came out and said, Mom, the doctor said something very rare. <laughs> it was hard. And I, I went into the ladies' room and I was sobbing. And I believe it was probably a woman doctor came in and she asked me what was wrong. And I told her and she said, you have to be strong for him. So then I realized, yes, we're going to have to cope with this together. But when the doctor finally told me it was something rare, the first thing I asked is, will he live? <laughs> and when he said yes, I thought, praise the Lord, we will live with this. I remember after all the, the doctor appointments that day and the, the tests, that we went outside the hospital to go home. And I, I thought the world was supposed to stop for some reason because I was going blind. I mean, it's like, this was big news. When I went into the ladies' room, I looked out the window and I was looking down and I saw a basketball court. And I thought, he's not gonna play basketball anymore. A lot of things started turning for me uh, during that basketball season. I was having trouble catching the ball. I remember uh, I had a lot of like twisted, bent up fingers, had a couple bloody noses. It seemed like the ball was like, instead of being able to see it from long distance, it was like coming to me real fast, like right in front of me, like maybe 10, 15 feet away. I started losing a lot of self-confidence. And I remember one time I went up for a, a, a layup and I got fouled. I got on the free throw line and I was bouncing the ball and I looked up at the hoop and it was blurry, it was gone. I looked over at the bleachers and I was looking for mom and my uh, girlfriend and I couldn't see them either. And I, I was almost like ready to cry or something. A lot of the kids that he played sports with and everything, all of a sudden they didn't want to have anything to do with him. They didn't know if it was catchy or what? I remember my mom took me out to uh, Long Island and the, and the bluff there and we looked at the full moon. She says, oh, look at that beautiful full moon. The, the man on the moon's face is real pretty. And I looked up at the sky and I said, where is it? All I could think about was that I wouldn't be able to do anything. And I didn't know where to go next. And uh, I remember that night thinking about that dream I had. And I remember just praying to God and asked him to help me. And um, I fell asleep.
Well, my parents moved to Las Cruces, New Mexico in 1970. And two years later, my sister and I and George came to visit them. And George immediately said, I can see better here. So much light. Back east, we had the cloudy days, the snowy days, and he said, I can see better. We went to the high school here and stated that George would be coming here and that he's visually handicapped, be prepared. The first day he was in school, the teacher said, oh, you're perfect for our basketball team. Wow. He was devastated. He walked out of class. He walked out of the school. And he came home and said, Mom, I don't belong there. I belong in the Alamogordo School for the Blind. And that's where he finished his senior year. And that's where he took up wrestling and running. I have a condition called juvenile macular degeneration, which means I got it as a young person. And the disease is called fundus flavi maculitis. There's only 20 medical cases in the world that have been diagnosed with this rare eye disease. I have no central vision and very little peripheral vision. And that is very, very blurry. And because of that, I'm considered legally blind. The thing about George is, is you meet him, he's bigger than life. He's just a real, he's tall, he has a big smile, uh, just a, a big goofy kid grin on his face. You like him immediately when you meet him. And talking to him and, and hearing about what he's thinking about and interacting with him, you like him even more. He's just a wonderful, warm person. As my world grew darker and I felt like things were closing in on me, I used art and painting as an expression and I put on the brightest colors I could on a canvas so I could light up the world with the light that was inside my mind and the visions that I had inside my head that were dancing around and around. When I first met him, I thought, well, okay, a painter. And then I saw the images and I saw, I've, I, I've, I've been out in the yard and, and witnessed his, his painting. He really does it. It's incredible work. It's very appealing. I think he's up to like 118 paintings that he's done just in the last few years. He's achieving what he wants to using his literal vision with his internal artistic vision. They're works that are life affirming. They have a completeness to them, a finished, um, self-awareness, I think. Well, I think it's a world of eyes and different colors all mixed into a, into a crazy kaleidoscope. What I love about my paintings is they're real bright, they're exciting, and children to adults just come up and say, man, where did you get this from, you know? I mean, this is like sending me off to another world, and, and it's full of bright colors, and it's surreal, and it's a dreamscape. Cool. I think it's absolutely amazing that the artist is able to produce the quantity of paintings that he is still producing, uh, the fact that he has macular degeneration. I'm a painter and I paint a lot of details in my work and it's all about having good lighting to make sure I can see what I'm doing, but to know that he can't perfectly see what he's doing and he's still coming up with these details and just the vibrancy of his pieces. It's really amazing. Just look at the colors that he puts together. To me, it's just one big fantasy and uh, it, it takes me away from reality. question I had for George was, so what if you could get eyesight back? And his answer to that was, as, as much as I insisted, no, that, that would be a crippling thing. I've, I've learned how to live with what I have so well that restoring some sort of artificial uh, eyesight would take away my vision. I feel that I am blind for a reason on this world, and that's to light up the world with these different types of visions that I see. And I'm really excited when people get really excited about my paintings. Then I started getting exposed to, to what he had written. And uh, it's incredible stuff. His life is full of, of interesting, rich stories. The last 10 years I've been spending writing six or seven uh, novels 
Go ahead and let's let's read this one out loud and and um, let's see how it, how it goes. And they're about spiritual fantasies or allegories. They teach us things about love, hate, war, peace, that deal with overcoming obstacles in a dream world uh, setting. That sense of adventure, of feeling of being on my own, is where I truly found myself on a small farm with her parents and her brother Wallace. What I remember most about New York City were the tall buildings, the dinosaurs at the museums, and of course the Garden of Eden. As I crashed through the woods, I stumbled in the darkness. I could not see anything in front of me at all. I was all alone. In the darkness, I screamed out. Uh, a year after I went blind, I was invited to actually be a junior counselor for a summer camp for blind children. So I was a counselor there and I met this girl, Debbie. She was about nine years old and she was totally blind. I, I walked Debbie down to the beach and um, it was real windy that day. It was just her and I and I was guiding her, uh, holding her hand. And um, she had real long dark brown hair or light brown hair. And uh, all of a sudden the wind just picked up off the ocean and threw her hair in back of her. And she turned around and asked me if I knew what color is the wind. That blew me away. I think what he's done is basically cap capitalized on his handicap. Instead of sitting in the corner and saying, poor me. He does not spend any time feeling sorry for himself, dwelling on the past. He has tried to cope with it and go with it. When he talks about the past, he's talking about interesting and, and fun and informative things that have happened to him, the things that make up his life. He doesn't dwell on uh, negative things. He works toward some vision of where he might be six months or a year from now, and he works and he works and he works. And live with it and share with other people what it's like. And I think that's wonderful. I really appreciate what this little girl said, because if that's what it takes for her to live in this world of darkness and just her imagination has taken her to this new level where the world, the wind is just spinning around and around in a sea of colors, a rainbow of colors. I'd rather live in that world than have live in the world of sight where it's just, okay, you know, there's no imagination. There's, the wind is invisible. There's no color in the wind. What color is the wind opened up my mind uh, forever? That was a huge turning point in my life. My best friend, T.G. Gibbs, who was a uh, friend of mine at the blind school, he's legally blind like myself, died in a terrible motorcycle accident kept telling me that I wasn't doing anything with my life, that I was giving up, that I was a quitter, I was feeling sorry for myself. He kept telling me about this place uh, called Chimayota that I needed to come to the church and pray. He uh, told me that I could be a, <laughs> a champion runner and kind of a light to the handicap community and athletes. Well, I kept praying to God I, you know, I didn't even know what I was praying for, a miracle or, or to get my eyesight back or just maybe to, you know, do something with my life. I really don't know. It was like on the third or fourth day that I was here, I was inside the church and, and by then I was about ready to go home. And, and I knew that I wasn't going to see, I just, you know, it wasn't like a physical, I wasn't going to get my sight back. I was already almost quitting again. I could feel it. It was like the church was dark inside and all of a sudden somebody turned on a bright light and it surrounded me and it was like bright lights and it was warm. And there was people in wheelchairs and blind people trying to touch me and I said, no, I can't help you. I can't even help myself. I started seeing myself running, running, running toward the light. 
And I was, as I was running toward this light, I was touching the people in wheelchairs and the people that were blind. And they like could walk out of their wheelchairs and they could see again. After that experience, I sat down with this board that still hangs in the church. And like in a stream of consciousness, the words just flowed. I am blind, travel many miles to Chimayo, a place of peace and silence, a place that I love. And right after that, uh, people said that they, they saw a lot of changes in me. I no longer was feeling sorry for myself. I don't know what happened in this church. Something did happen, and after that miracle, when I was 19 years old, boom, wow. I mean, it's like my life just took off. I no longer felt sorry for myself. I got into running immediately. Then it took off. I set all kinds of national world records in track and field, got to travel all over the world. I was selected to represent my country in the 1980 Olympics for the physically disabled. I competed against 44 countries and about four or 5,000 different athletes. It was an amazing event. We got to run about six weeks in Europe. I got to see a lot of Europe there. Life was just going really good for me at that time. I was like born again, I was changed. It's so ironic to me that my best friend had to die to get me up to go to that church. Because if he hadn't died, I never would have gone to that church. I experienced a miracle. To me, there are miracles everywhere. The little miracles that make up life every day in our lives. You just have to have an open mind, open up your eyes to see them and find them. And you have to be courageous enough to accept them and to make that change. George is the kind of guy that, by golly, if, if he knows where to go with something, if he knows what it is that he wants to accomplish, he'll insist. But that doesn't mean he's not listening. When he wants something, he will not give up. He'll go for it and go for it and go for it. And I admire that quality in him. He's kind of relentless because Frankly, he has a lot of time on his hands. A lot of us take for granted that, that we can read a book or, or watch TV or you know, do the things that, that we all do to, to occupy our time. When George is alone, um, he has his work. What I want people to get out of my life story comes down to one word, persistence. You can have all the education in the world, you can have all the talent in the world, you can be a genius. But if you're going to overcome obstacles, if you're persistent, you will reach your dreams and accomplish all the goals that you have set in your life. As long as you're breathing, you have a chance to be somebody and to do something great in this world. You know, if you would have told me, uh, you know, I'm going to go blind at 15 and get back into athletics. You know, I, I just would have said, not me, you know, this isn't gonna be the path I'm gonna take in my life. I wouldn't replace it for anything. A lot of people ask me, what would you be doing with your life if you could see? And I tell them, well, you know, I, I don't know what I would be doing, but I wouldn't replace what I'm doing now. That my artwork sells and is shown all over the world. To me, it's like, you know, if I could see and paint, I would paint what everybody else paints. I'm not interested in that. I run, I'm 50 years old and I still run every other day. And uh, <laughs> I've been really blessed. And I've been blessed with a lot of talents. And I don't regret it because he's had all these wonderful experiences and that's what makes him too, the way he is now, traveling and the Olympics and all the sports he was active in and things he's done. Finished college, which I never did, and I'm proud of that. And I said to myself, from here on in, things are gonna get better. I didn't know how they were gonna, you know, how I was gonna make it as a blind person. But you know what? If you can't laugh through all this madness, you're gonna lose it, you know? For some reason, God put me in this position where I joined this special
population, if you will, that's been totally ignored by society. My son is very strong. It's weird. It really is. Sometimes it's overwhelming. And then sometimes it's just normal, you know, and that, you know, it's just everybody goes through it. You know, and I'm just uh, just a pilgrim, pilgrim going through a journey here in life. He knows what he wants in this world and he goes for it. He cares about other people. He is a wonderful person. I'm proud to be his mother. If that's what it takes to, you know, to lose a little, to lose your sight and to have this new gift of, you know, imagination, I'll take it. Because I would love to live in that little girl's mind. I am blind. I've traveled many miles to a place called Chimayo. It's a place I love. In its silence and its peace, to this heaven I must go. Where the sun falls asleep without regret It's that old country feeling